Today I want to share with you how to make an herbal elixir and specifically one that dates back to the 16th century that was often used to relieve the symptoms of a cold, tummy troubles, or difficulty sleeping. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. The first thing I want to say is if at any time you want to jump ahead in this video, be sure to check the description and the pinned comment underneath this video where I'll have detailed timestamps. I'll also have a link there that'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, where I'll have the printable recipe for the elixir we're going to make today. The second thing I want to mention is when it comes to working with herbs, if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, if you're thinking of using these with children, if you take medication either over the counter or prescription, or if you have allergies, be sure to check with your medical professional to make sure that the herbs you're thinking of using are appropriate for your particular condition. Now we're going to go over the ingredients that you need to make this elixir. Then I want to take a little time to explain to you exactly what an elixir is and why you would want to make one and how it's similar or maybe different than a tonic. Well, the elixir we're going to make today is based on a formula that was developed by Benedictine monks in the 16th century, 1510 to be exact. Now, the first thing that you're going to need for the herbs is a third of a cup of angelica root, a third of a cup of hyssop, and a third of a cup of a lemon balm. Now, if you already have these herbs on hand, fantastic. If not, my friend Cianne over at Farmhouse Teas sells very high quality herbs, plus she has a discount for my viewers. And I'll be sure to put that information in the description and in the pinned comment underneath this video. The next thing that you're going to need is one cup of pourable honey. What I've got here is, it does say raw and unfiltered, but what I specifically like about this particular pourable honey it's made, or it's not made, I guess it's made by the bees. <laughs> it's a local honey. And if you do have access to a local honey, all the better. The final ingredient that you're gonna need is some type of liquid. Now, when it comes to making elixirs, I like to use alcohol. Now, if you wanna use something like glycerin or vinegar, that's not something that I do. However, my friend Heidi over at Rain Country Homestead does make various tinctures and tonics and whatnot using glycerin and vinegar. And I'll be sure to put a link to her channel in the description underneath this video. However, keep in mind that something made with alcohol is going to have a much longer shelf life than those made with glycerin or vinegar. Now I'm specifically using vodka because it's colorless and basically flavorless. Uh, you could certainly use other types of alcohol as well. However, when you read various books by herbalists, they often tend to use vodka. And just like my honey, I've got a local vodka made right here in the Austin, Texas area. Now I do want to mention for this elixir, even though we are using alcohol, you take a very small amount of this, no more than a teaspoon. So if that helps you make a decision as to how you want to make this, whether with alcohol, glycerin, or vinegar, uh, that's something to keep in mind, that you're taking a very small amount. Now we'll get ready to make our elixir, and if you're familiar with elixir, you can check the timestamps and jump ahead. But for those of you who may be new to the term, I just want to explain to you what an elixir is. Now today, the term elixir and tonic are often used interchangeably. However, throughout history, they did have different meanings. This book that I want to read to you from has a wonderful uh, explanation of what a tonic is. And if you're not familiar with this book, this is called The Herbal Apothecary. 
and it's by J.J. Purcell. And she's a very interesting uh, woman. She is a certified naturopath physician. And what she says about tonics is that they are meant to be taken in small amounts, same as the, an elixir, typically one ounce doses to strengthen the body, mind, and spirit. So a tonic was basically used to just create a general sense of well-being for overall good health. And I want to mention that if you are new to herbs, I often tell you uh, that I love the books by Rosemary Gladstar and I highly recommend those because her uh, herbal book for beginners is a wonderful introduction to identifying herbs, growing herbs, and how to use herbs. And also J.J. Purcell's books are wonderful as well. And specifically this uh, Herbal Apothecary is an excellent book and I highly recommend it. Alrighty, so that's what a tonic is, sort of like a overall uh, solution to take in a very small dose to just provide a sense of good, you know, to, to help maintain good health, to help you feel good. So what exactly is an elixir? An elixir was often made, and now we're talking way back, you know, in the uh, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, when people didn't have the ability to have modern day medicine, often uh, the healers of the day would make elixirs and elixirs were often used to treat a specific condition. So the person compounding them would find those herbs and often spices that were known to benefit particular conditions. It could be a cold, it could be a headache, it could be a, some tummy, tummy troubles. It could be difficulty sleeping, whatever the case may be. And they would pull these herbs together and make a particular elixir. But as we know, herbs often have multi-purposes. They may be helpful in relieving the symptoms of a cold or just generally making you feel better. They may uh, help you feel a little drowsy and sleep. They may calm indigestion. They may do all of those things just from one herb. So when you make an elixir of a mixture of herbs that you think, for example, help the upper respiratory tract, they may also be helping other things as well. So you can see kind of an overlap of a tonic that's made with herbs and spices and that is taken in small doses just for well-being. It often has a lot of herbs and spices in it versus an elixir that may have just one herb or one spice or maybe even a combination but maybe a smaller combination. But sometimes, as I said, they can be very similar and some elixirs can have a lot of herbs and spices in them. But I like to call this an elixir because it does date back uh, to the 16th century. It's very old fashioned. And I think the term elixir is it's kind of charming. It's kind of interesting, kind of intriguing. So that is the history of tonics and elixirs. Now, a little bit of the history behind the elixir we're making today. I've got my iPad here because I want to read something to you about the original elixir that was made in the 16th century. Now what we're making today is very loosely based on that, but I thought you might find this interesting. The original elixir recipe was developed by a Benedictine monk, Dom Bernardo Vincelli, and he was with the Abbey of Fécamp in Normandy, France. And apparently the monks at this abbey would make this elixir uh, to help the townspeople or whomever that might be feeling that they were coming down with a cold or had tummy troubles. Sometimes it's sort of all related. You have a cold, you have a little upset stomach, you have a little trouble sleeping. And this particular monk developed this mixture. Now, it had a lot of herbs and spices in it. It had locally grown herbs and then spices which they were able to get in Europe at the time from various spice trades. 
Now, years later, there's a lot of history and a lot of story behind all of this, but years later, this recipe was somehow given to or fell into the hands of someone who turned this elixir into a liqueur. Uh, it's usually used as what is known as like an after-dinner drink, a digestif, to aid in digestion, digestif. Now the liqueur that's sold today, based on the monk's original recipe, has actually been around for a very long time itself. And it's a secret recipe that contains 27 herbs and spices. Now only 21 of those herbs and spices are known, and the remaining are a secret. Now there are three main herbs that are known from the original monk's recipe, for his elixir, as well as the modern day liqueur. And those include angelica root, hyssop, and lemon balm, what I shared with you in the beginning. So our elixir is only made from three herbs. Hopefully that'll make it easy to make as opposed to 21 known herbs. And if you wanted to guess, another six. So our herbal elixir is very helpful for upper respiratory troubles, tummy troubles, and sleep troubles, because each of these herbs contributes some properties to aiding in those discomforts. Now, as we go into cold and flu season, I always find that it's helpful to have a number of different types of natural remedies on hand so that you have a variety of things to choose from based on how you're feeling and also based on what agrees with you. Now, keep in mind, if you're very sick, I always say definitely uh, talk to your doctor, see your doctor and get the proper modern day medications that you need. However, having these natural remedies on hand often can just offer us some comfort. Now, the only supply that you're going to need is some type of jar and you want a glass jar. Now, can you use just your typical modern day quart size jar with a, a leak proof lid? Definitely. The reason that I'm showing each of these, this is a clamp jar here, this is one I've already made, and this is just a WEC jar uh, with a glass lid, because I know some of you have shared with me that you're uncomfortable about making any type of herbal or herbal and spice or spice natural remedies in anything that may touch plastic. Uh, so these are some of the op options you have. These clamp jars are very popular. You see them in all the kitchen stores and online as well. I'll be sure to put some links in the description below in case you can't find them locally. Uh, but they're usually made in France or Italy, so very, very good quality. And then of course, if you have any wet canning jars with the glass lid, these will work as well. The nice thing about the traditional like ball style canning jars that have uh, the leak proof lids, uh, you do need to mix this up uh, during the steeping process. So if you're the type of person who just likes to be able to do something like this, then those uh, ball canning jars with the leak proof lids come in very handy. However, I will say that I do find since this is a mixture with honey to actually go in like with a fork or a spoon or a knife, whatever you have and actually stir your elixir as it's steeping. I personally think that works. I personally think that works very well. Now, if you want to make a larger amount of this, you certainly can. This is a very easy recipe to adapt. It's basically a third, a third, and a third. A third of your herbs, a third of your honey, and a third of your liquid. In this case, we're using the vodka. So I've got one cup of the herbs, we're gonna use one cup of honey, and we're gonna use one cup of the vodka. Now you'll find when you read about elixirs that herbalists will have differences of opinions as to how to make them. Some will recommend taking your herbs and taking your vodka and making a tincture first. And then once your tincture is done, just adding in some honey. And then voila, you have your elixir. And why are we making the elixir? Because the elixir can be easier to take than the tincture in terms of taste thanks to the honey. However, other herbalists will say, you can just mix it all together. You can mix in your herbs, 
mix in your honey, which is basically a forever food. You don't need to worry about that going bad. And then pour in your alcohol, which is an amazing preservative. Mix it all up and just let it steep. And that's what I do. And I found it to work very well. But do know that if you do have already, if you already have any tinctures made, you can easily add some honey to them and create an elixir. And when you add some honey to your tincture, you now have an elixir that can help with whatever that tincture was made to help with. Now I've got a measuring cup here, so we'll measure out everything. And I've already measured out my herbs. I've got a third of a cup of each of these. Uh, but I will confess to you that I also often just eyeball it. It's not a 100% exact science, so you don't need to worry if you say, oh honey, so sticky, I don't really wanna have to measure it out in a cup. What you can do is once you get your herbs in, then you'll see how much they fill your jar. Maybe you even have marks, like the canning jars are very nice because they have marks. And then you can just fill the honey up to the point that it's the same amount as the herbs. So that's, a, that's sort of an easy way to do it. But we'll go ahead and we'll put in our angelica, angelica root. And then we will go ahead and add in our hyssop. These all smell wonderful, by the way. They're so herb herbaceous, I believe that's the word. And then we'll go ahead and put in our lemon balm. Alrighty, so now we've got that taken care of. Now we'll measure out our cup of honey and we'll go ahead and add that in. Now we'll go ahead and pour in our honey. You'll find that the honey will immediately start sinking down into the herbs and there's no need to stir. Don't worry about it. You'll see what we do once we add in the vodka, which is just going to make the whole stirring process a lot easier. Now I've not rinsed out my cup and I'm just going to go ahead and add in my vodka. And now I'm just going to go ahead and pour in my cup of vodka. I'm going to give it a little stir just to get the last bits of that honey in there. Now I like to just take a fork and stir this all together. I find a fork works really well. Uh, certainly you could use your spatula, but uh, this kind of just seems to really get into all the nooks and crannies, especially working with all those herbs. But as you'll see, it's much easier to mix together. If you've ever made like the homemade cough medicine that I share with you, where you're just mixing herbs and honey, it's, and I think even in that video, I go, oh, it's a sticky wicket. <laughs> and it really is. But this is very easy to mix. I think you're going to find this is just so easy to make. Now that you've got this all stirred up, all you're going to do is go ahead and put your lid on. Now with the wet jars, we need to use the little clamps, which are a little more precarious, but it can be done. Now, during the steeping time, which we'll talk about in a minute, you want to make sure that maybe like every couple of days you give this a good stir. And that's because uh, the herbs will be periodically floating up to the top. Now, eventually they'll float less and less and they'll be more submerged uh, in the liquid. However, you do wanna always make sure that over that steeping time, we'll, and as I said, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you do wanna make sure that you come in with your fork, your spoon, your knife, whatever you're using, and give it a good stir. And if you've got the uh, leak-proof lids, empty, you know, and not empty, but turn it upside down and then right side up again and do that a couple of times and then put it back into wherever you're allowing it to steep. Uh, this is not as sensitive as things like ferments. So if you wanna keep this in a pantry, you can. If you wanna keep it on your counter to be a helpful reminder to stir it, you can certainly do that too. Now, let's talk about the steeping time. Again, as with so many things when it comes to herbs and spices and making natural remedies, Herbalists do have some differences of opinion as to how long an elixir should steep. And it's the sort of same differences of opinion that you hear about with tinctures and tonics and so on and so forth. However, uh, the general rule is somewhere between two weeks and six weeks. 
and I usually split the difference and steep my elixirs for about four weeks. I'm gonna set this aside to steep and I'm gonna clean up this area. Then I'm gonna show you how to strain this and decant it and what the proper amount is to take. I want to share with you the nice thing about making a natural remedy specifically with these herbs, angelica root, hyssop, and lemon balm, is that these are herbs that have been extensively studied by scientists for their various properties, respiratory, digestive, sleep, and so on and so forth. And in the blog post that I'll have that'll correspond with this video, where you can also get the printable recipe, I will have a lot of information about the scientific studies surrounding these herbs and with various links that you can read the actual studies in detail. Now, when it comes to straining this, you have a couple of options. But the way I like to do this is simply to strain it once through a fine mesh strainer into some sort of vessel to catch it, uh, to catch the elixir, and then just do a second straining through another fine mesh strainer into another vessel. And the reason that I like to do this is if I line this with cheesecloth, I find it's just a bit of a mess. And I think it's because of the addition of the honey. It just doesn't flow as easily, and it is a little bit of a just a, like with the cough medicine, a little bit of a sticky wicket. Uh, it is easier to stir than the cough medicine, but even so with the honey in it, I prefer just to strain it without any cheesecloth. Now, if you strain it with the cheesecloth, then yes, you're 100% going to have a perfect elixir down on the bottom and you're not going to see even one speck of herb. But I do find with the double straining process like this, it's pretty darn near perfect to what it would be uh, using the flour sack towel or um, cheesecloth. Some I know some of you will use cheesecloth. Now I also want to mention, I'm going to show you what to do with the herbs once they're in the strainer. You do not want to throw them out. I'm going to try to do this as neatly as possible. And here we go. Alrighty. See, it's a bit of a sticky wicket. I'm just using my little spatula here to get out every little last bit of goodness from my jar. Now, a little secret to prevent too many of the herbs sinking down through the mesh strainer into your elixir is to not press down on these herbs. Yes, you might be saying, oh, would it be great to get every last little bit of elixir out of it? I understand that completely. But you're just going to leave this for a little while and you're going to let it drip, drip, drip. And over time, you'll notice that it'll start, it'll stop dripping. And then that will be your indication that you're ready to do your second straining. But don't worry that you're not compressing this and trying to get every little last bit out of your uh, herbal concoction, so to speak because we're not going to waste this. We're not gonna throw these out. You're gonna see what we're gonna do. Now, I'm just gonna transfer my mesh strainer with the herbs in it to another bowl here and let that stay there for a while until we address that. And now I'm gonna do my second, oops, sorry. I'm gonna do my second straining through this mesh strainer and we'll see if we catch any little bits. Yeah, see, we're catching a few little bits of herbs. I like to do this very slowly. And then if you find at the very, very end, there's any little bits of debris uh, that, because they do tend to sink to the bottom, don't worry, we can go ahead and just add that to here. For now, to, to the remaining herbs in the, in the mesh strainer. For now, what we want to do is to just try and get our elixir to be as clear as possible. Now, as you strain your elixir through your second mesh strainer, you will notice it catching just a few little bits and bobs 
of some of the herbs. And now you have something that is really beautifully strained. Plus, as you're straining it, using your larger vessel, whatever you're using, I love these measuring cups, it makes it very easy. You will notice as you get down to the very bottom of the measuring cup or the bowl, whatever you're using, you'll see some little debris that has sunk to the bottom. Don't feel you need to pour that out to get every last, lit of, every last little bit of your elixir. You've got a nice amount of elix elixir here, which you will realize once we talk about dosing. And this little bit that does have that little debris in it, you can go ahead, because if you've been with, with me for a while, you know I don't like to waste anything. Just go ahead and put that little bit in there, because we're going to make good use of it. Now for this, we can go ahead and decant this in really any type of bottle that you like. You can use the little tincture bottles that also have the eyedropper or the slightly larger bottles uh, that don't have an eyedropper. It doesn't matter. What's nice is if you do have amber colored bottles or sometimes they're navy blue, sometimes they're amber, uh, those are very good just to simply block out light and help preserve your elixir as long as possible. But if you have a clear bottle, if that's all you have, that's fine too. Uh, I know many of you have shared with me so many clever ideas how to block out light and preserve them. The easiest one, preserve your, whether they're tinctures or elixirs, whatever the case may be, that may be in clear glass bottles. The easiest one that I just thought was so perfect was simply to put your bottle in a brown paper bag. How fantastic is that? Now the shelf life of something like this is very long because we've used alcohol, which is a very strong preservative. Now when it comes to my tinctures, my elixirs, my tonics, whatever the case may be, I do like to refrigerate them, but I highly recommend that, as I mentioned earlier, books by Rosemary Gladstar or J.J. Purcell, I highly recommend educating yourself about these products and, and products that we're making homemade and what you are most comfortable doing, whether keeping them at room temperature or refrigerating them. I'm most comfortable refrigerating them. But there are many differences of opinions about this because you are making them with alcohol, uh, which is a wonderful preservative, as I mentioned earlier, and does create a very long shelf life. Uh, you do want to be more careful about what you do and then again I highly recommend you read about this if you use something like a glycerin or a vinegar. And if you do go the glycerin route, which you'll learn from uh, Heidi over at Rain Country Homestead, uh, you always want to make sure that you're using food safe glycerin. In terms of the yield, if you make your elixir based on the formula that we use today, you'll probably get somewhere around a cup and a quarter and a cup and a half of your final product, of your final elixir. And one and a quarter cup or one and a half cup is a significant amount of elixir because as you read about these things, you will find that often the dosage is just one teaspoon per day. So if you feel a little cold coming on and maybe it's associated with some stomach upset, maybe you're having trouble sleeping, most herbalists will rec recommend just taking one teaspoon of this type of elixir per day. Some herbalists will recommend up to one ounce per day, maybe spread out over the course of the day or in one dose. And again, this is why it's so important to work at educating yourself about herbs and reading wonderful books from Rosemary Gladstar or J.J. Purcell. And also, I have a friend also named Heidi, a different Heidi than the one from Rain Country Homestead, but she has a YouTube channel called uh, Healing, I believe it's Healing Her Herbal Harvest, but more importantly, she has a school, uh, an online school, the School of Botanical Arts and Sciences, where she teaches online classes all about herbs. And I think she may have been trained, I have to check on this, but I think she may have been trained by Rosemary Gladstar, but she's a, a wonderful resource, resource and her classes are terrific. And she's also provided a discount 
coupon code for my viewers and I'll be sure to put that information uh, in the description and in the pinned comment below. Now when I go ahead and decant this elixir, I'll decant it into a bottle like this with the little eyedropper. It's easy to simply uh, take a little bit out and put a teaspoons full onto a spoon. Uh, or I'll use a bottle like this and then I'll just pour it out. And if you have one of those tiny little uh, funnels, those work great unless you have an exceptionally steady hand. Sometimes I'm good at it, sometimes I'm not. Uh, but those little uh, funnels are very common. And Cianne, uh, my friend at Farmhouse Teas, who sells a whole collection of herbs and teas, uh, does sell these. Uh, you know, it's all nice on one page. It makes, she makes it very easy for you. She has the herbs for making this elixir, uh, these little bottles, the little funnel, uh, everything you need. So this is very easy to decant and this is exactly how I'll do it. Now what I like to do with this mixture is take some ice cube trays and just put a little bit into each opening. Now, because of the alcohol that these have been steeping in, they're not going to firm up real hard like an ice cube, but they will become firmer than the form that they're in right now. Now, do you need to go through all of this and delicately be filling these uh, ice cube trays? Not necessarily, but I like to do it because it will firm up a little and then I'll go ahead. I love this little ice cube container I have. It's just like a little box and I've got three trays in there. I can close this up and then I just put that right into my freezer. And then what I do is I'll pull this out and I'll just pop out one of these and I can put it into a little tea caddy like this. And then I use these to make a cup of tea. It's very, it's just a nice herb tea and it has a little bit of a sweet flavor to it. And as I said, a lot of the alcohol and the honey have drained out and are now in your elixir. So these do firm up, you know, as opposed to if you were just trying to freeze alcohol, which would not freeze up, but these do become firmer. And I really think that the amount of alcohol that's remaining in any of this uh, is considerably less. But certainly if that's a concern for you, you can do other things with this. You can allow this to air dry or oven dry or dry it in your uh, dehydrator and you can use it in potpourris and things like that if you would prefer not to be consuming it. And if you don't wanna go through the ice cube tray process, you can also just freeze these in little containers like this. And then when, once they are firmed up, you can just dump them right out like that. And if you're making a large amount of tea, you can put that has like a little uh, tea insert in it. You can go ahead and put it right into your tea insert and make your herbal tea that way. Or you can just go ahead and drop it right down into your teapot, let it steep, and then use a strainer when you're straining it out into your cup or cups. So you do not need to discard these herbs. There are other things that you can do with them. Now, the tea is relatively mild. Can you use these to make another elixir? I generally don't recommend it. If you have steeped it for the entire six weeks, I think most of the properties in the herbs have been extracted out. You could try a second batch if you've only steeped it for two weeks. After four weeks, I generally do what I'm doing here. I don't try to make another batch, but maybe after two weeks you could. And again, I recommend looking at different books on herbs and seeing what's generally recommended by herbalists who have had a lot of training on this. But for me, I really like the system that I have in place. Now, if you'd like more information on how to make a whole host of herbal remedies, plus immune boosting foods, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a very detailed playlist of all of that and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.